Dear friends and colleagues, welcome to the Korea Athletes Treatment for Musculoskeletal Disorder and Robotic Rehabilitation Therapy. It's my pleasure to run this webinar and to introduce our uh, faculty. I'm pleased to inform you that we have a group of excellent, eminent speakers in their fields. And we will start with Professor In Hu Shun, who is a professor of orthopedic surgery in uh, Asian Medical Center, Olsen University. And he will talk to us about the advances in shoulder and elbow arthroplasty. Following this, we will meet Professor Inju, uh, sorry, uh, Si Yang Park from Korean University, who will tell us about bi biportal spinal uh, endoscopic treatment. This will be followed by Professor Jun Ho Wang from Samsung Medical Center to talk about the treatment of uh, ligament reconstruction using arthroscopic techniques. We will finish with an exciting uh, presentation by Professor Tun Wong Kra from uh, Severance Hospital about the robotics and wearable of exoskeletal uh, treatment of uh, rehabilitation medicine. So I'm sure you will enjoy this uh, webinar and I would like you to uh, welcome Professor In Ho Jun for his presentation. Please take on. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Professor In Ho Jeon from Asan Medical Center. I'm very grateful and thankful for you all to invite me and giving me a chance to share our experience about shoulder elbow arthroplasty. Now you are watching this aerial view of Asan Medical Center, the biggest medical center in Seoul and in South Korea, and we are aiming the best hospital in Asian country. So as you can see here, we have a big three clinical buildings and one research center and education center since 1989. We have almost 3,000 beds, 10,000 employees, and every day we have 12,000 outpatient clinics. We have a numerous center of excellence, but however, when it goes to the orthopedic surgery, as you can see here in this slide, we have over 3,000 scoliosis cases and joint replacement over 1,000 cases a year and arthroscopic surgery, over 50 cases every week. So this is our group photo of a shoulder and elbow team. We have two Saudi fellows, one Vietnamese, one Indonesian surgeon, and we are aiming for diversity and the unity in our team. This proximal humerus fracture, I understand you have a very good experience already. However, when it goes to the arthroplasty, it is a different story. So I'm going to talk about shoulder arthroplasty in proximal humerus fracture. So this is an interesting case of 78-year-old lady with four-part fracture. So what is your treatment option for this case? Would you like to do hemiarthroplasty, replacing this humeral head only, or would you like to do total shoulder replacement, replacing this glenoid with the polyethylene and glenoid backup? Or would you like to do the reverse type total shoulder arthroplasty? Now you can see here in a glenoid side, you have a ball, and humeral side, you have a socket. So what is the reverse total shoulder? and why we need to understand reverse total shoulder and what is the reality of a reverse total shoulder. This is the topic I would like to share with you today. As you can see here, shoulder is the same as like the any other joint, you have degenerative arthritis. But in the shoulder joint, there's a very unique condition different from hip and knee, which is massive tear induced arthritis of the glenohumeral joint. 
So this unique condition of arthritis caused by the massive rotator cuff tear is what we call rotator cuff tear arthropathy. So if you do a hemiarthroplasty in cuff deficient shoulder, the literature say unpredictable results in terms of pain, in terms of range of motion. So the hemi for cuff deficient shoulder is what we call limited goal surgery. How about total shoulder arthroplasty? If you do a sh total shoulder in rotate cuff deficient shoulder, this is what is happening. Because you don't have a superior restraint, you don't have a superior head depressor, there happens rocking horse phenomenon. So always humeral head, you have an eccentric load on the glenoid, and glenoid have a superior edge loading, and glenoid loosening is inevitable. So in the history, reverse ball and socket joint has been developed. This constraint type prosthesis, unfortunately, all failed because of the eccentric load on the glenoid side. So how we can overcome this failure? of constrained ball and socket joint? The answer is to medialize the center of rotation. In a normal shoulder, as you can see here, lateral deltoid and part of anterior deltoid is your active elevator. But if you medialize the shoulder, as you can see here in this slice, on top of this lateral, and anterior deltoid, you have excessive anterior and posterior deltoid, which is actually working as a lateral elevator. This is the background of the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. So let's get back to the 70, 80 year old again. So what is your surgical option for this? The literature is uh, saying the hemi for four part fracture is unreliable especially for elderly people. As you can see here in a slice from JBJS, the patient satisfaction is very good, over 80%. But when it goes to the active range of motion, some are amazingly good, over 130 degree, but some are 70 degree like this. This is why we call it it's an unreliable result. So you have to keep in mind, if you do a hemi, for elderly people, the overall complication rate is over 64%. That means more than half of your patient will struggle with the complications. So as you can see here in this slide, complication of hemi, the most common complication is a tuberosity resorption. What it happened is, in the beginning, you have a tuberosity intact. But as you goes, you have a no tuberosity and eventually this position and head migration at the end. So according to the report, if you do hemiarthroplasty, the most common complication is a tuberosity resorption, displacement, malposition, eventually your humeral head sublooks upward. So when you do a hemiarthroplasty, every effort to achieve good tuberosity healing by positioning anatomic rotation according to this bicepital groove and secure fixation horizontal and vertical. So this is the clinical report. If you do a hemi, you actually have a two peak, very good result and below average growth. However, if you do reverse, mostly patients have reliable good results. The only one common complication you can see in the clinical setting is this uh, progressive notching of the inferior aspect of scapula neck. This is sometimes clinically relevant, but sometimes uh, not. So this is our case, a 75-year-old lady with a chronic locked dislocation. And you can see humeral head is already destroyed with the glenoid head, glenoid deficiency. What we did was reverse total shoulder replacement, and this is post-op x-rays. We did our best to 
have a good tuberous day healing because of tuberous day fixation, you have better results. However, as time goes, four years post you see the resorption of the tuberous day is still there. However, this patient had a good clinical result, good pain relief. This is another 71-year-old man with a nasty community proximal humerus fracture involving this proximal metaphysis. We did a reverse total shoulder, proximal metaphysis, had a sound healing, and patient had a good range of motion with good pain relief. So when you are thinking about the reverse total shoulder for proximal humerus fracture, you have to keep in mind there's a two different indications, one for hemi, one for reverse. Reverse total shoulder is best indicated for elderly, rotate cuff deficient shoulder, and tuberous decomination. However, the complication of a scapula neck notching is oftentimes associated with the reverse total shoulder. 자, 잠깐 넘어가겠습니다. 그 다음. So next one, we are moving on to the total elbow arthroplasty. Total elbow arthroplasty is the same as like the any kind of artificial joint replacement is best indicated for rheumatoid, primary OA, fracture, and fracture sequelae. So this is a typical advanced rheumatoid arthritis. Patient has a pain and limitation in daily activity after replacing this elbow joint with the total elbow replacement, pain had a very... After total elbow replacement, patient had a good pain relief and achieved very good range of motion. This is a lady with the advanced osteoarthritis. As you can see here, there's no joint space, huge spur in the front and back, and we had after total elbow replacement, patient had a functional range of motion with good pain relief. Now she could do daily activity without any limitation. So these are two different types of uh, total elbow arthroplasty. One is a linked type, the other is unlinked type. Basically these two prostheses are all indicated for same pathology. However, one thing keep in mind is unlinked prosthesis you need minimal bone defect and soft tissue balancing. So if you have a huge bone defect with no unreliable soft tissue, then it's better to choose linked prosthesis. So how to get it right total elbow replacement? I pick up five important things here. How to maximize exposure, how to handle ulnar what about the implant performance, how to avoid infection, what about the arthroplasty result depending on the diagnosis? This is our uh, setting for total elbow replacement. Patient supine with the arm on the chest and usually skin incision on top of this ulna border. And it is very important to know that good exposure is essential for good surgery. There is no ideal exposure. However, you have to keep in mind triceps handling is essential part of this total elbow because extensor mechanism is most important for total knee replacement, which is same here in total elbow replacement. This is our uh, setting for total elbow replacement. Uh, triceps tongue approach is our standard and we make a skin incision on top of this uh, ulna border and we identify this ulna nerve first It's always better to transpose the ulna nerve and then we elevate the triceps fascia, tongue shape. And then this is uh, very important to keep this attachment to the olecranon. And then we lift up this uh, common flexor and extends off from the both medial epicondyle. And then we resect the radial head, remove this radial head, and then capsular release and then we dislocate this elbow to do uh, implantation. So if you have a huge spur in olecranon, 
sometimes it's better to remove this electron diff. This is how we can carry on total elbow replacement. So how to handle ulnar nerve? According to our study, if you like to avoid any ulnar nerve complications, it's always better to decompress and transpose. What about the implant performance? This is the consequence of a mechanical failure. Mechanical failure is very common in weight lifting elbow. And also if your patient is too young or too active after total elbow, they are high risk. And this mechanical failure is more common in inflammatory arthritis than traumatic condition. So in a clinical setting in Assam Medical Center, we have seen a complications requiring revision surgery. The most common complication is a loosening and periprosthetic fracture, as you can see here in this slide. And the next one is deep infection. So this is a, a revision total elbow ready. Uh, she had a total elbow replacement elsewhere and then had a mechanical failure and loosening which we conducted allograft prosthetic composite reconstruction and the clinical result was very successful. What about the deep infection? We published our paper how to avoid the deep infection in total elbow replacement, but you have to keep in mind elbow is a very subcutaneous joint, so always keep in mind soft tissue envelope is essential for successful surgery. Any concern raised during surgery, you're always better to do prophylactic soft tissue reconstruction surgery first before you implant surgery. And last one is arthroplasty by diagnosis. Inflammatory arthritis, as you can see here, advanced rheumatoid is the best indicated. And I usually do a triceps tongue approach to preserve extensor mechanism intact and the trauma condition is also for indicated for total elbow replacement. This is the total elbow replacement in elderly people. You can see here very communicated fracture which involves arthritic joint. This is best indicated for total elbow replacement. But as same as like the, any kind of osteoporotic elderly fracture, they have a poor bone stock, joint damage, and fracture combination. This is a trauma sequelae. Uh, after distal humerus fracture fixation, she had also very severe ulnar neuropathy with the pain and instability. What we did was a triceps tongue approach again, ulnar double release decompression, and then we replaced this uh, total elbow replacement. So this is another patient with a post-traumatic arthritis. She had a distal humerus fracture fixation elsewhere. However, as you can see here, the fracture fixation was not secure enough, and she had a painful non-union with severe ulnar neuropathy. So what we did was a ulnar nerve decompression and release triceps sparing approach and then retained all this metal implant intact and conducted total elbow replacement. So if you are wondering what the total elbow arthroplasty is survival by indication, the rheumatoid arthritis is best indicated and the best for 10-year survivalship. Thank you very much for your attention and hope we can have uh, more communication either by web or face-to-face -face conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor John. And now um, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Si Yong Park to present his uh, bi-portal endoscopic spinal surgery. We will keep all the questions that mentioned earlier to the end of the uh, webinar, and we will uh, ask all the panel your question. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I am Shiong Bak from Seoul, Korea. 
Uh, I'm orthopedic spine surgeon. Uh, I have worked as a professor of Korean University College of Medicine uh, since 2006. I've published more than 100 peer-reviewed papers in Korean and English as well. And I have focused on the minimally invasive spine surgery, such as a bipotal uh, endoscopic spine surgery. Uh, I am very pleased to inform you about uh, my experience, live surgery experience uh, at the international orthopedic meetings. Uh, at 2019, I am a performer successfully to live surgery at the annual Congress of uh, Korean Orthopedic Association. Uh, we, uh, we could offer the safety and feasibility of this surgery to patient with a lumbar spinal stenosis. As you know, the standard surgery is patient with a lumbar spinal surgery is decompression, including the laminectomy and discectomy. We have easily performed this kind of surgery uh, with wide open incision many years ago. However, nowadays, uh, spine surgeon and the patient also the prefer the minimal invasive surgery uh, using microscope or the endoscope, like this way. Today, I'm going to take uh, uh, about a bipotal endoscopy surgery. Uh, it is uh, some are new technique in spine surgery field. Uh, as you know, the we can perform a unipotal endoscopy like this way, uh, like uh, such as uh, PLD and the MED. It can be uh, applied almost uh, uh, every disease, but sometimes limited because of technical difficulty and flexibility. Uh, it is somewhat difficult to, to perform a sufficient bony structure removal. When you compare with the unipotal surgery, uh, bipotal technique is, can be performed like this way. Unilateral approaches and we can make uh, two separate incisions and proximal portal is viewing and distal portal is working. We can do everything uh, with uh, two uh, different incisions. As you know, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. Uh, so we, uh, orthopedic spine surgeon is uh, very familiar with uh, arthroscopic surgeries. So this kind of bipotal surgeries do not need any uh, special instrument like uh, PLD set. So I perform uh, this kind of surgeries using the, this arthroscopic uh, set. I prefer the zero degree arthroscope and I I made uh, two different incisions doing the like this way. And I preferred using the video system to give us some best view and the recording system to educate the patient and the doctors as well. During the surgery, I usually uh, using the, this continuous irrigation system to control the bleeding and the infection. Let me show the, the, uh, my uh, surgical procedure. As I mentioned, I prefer the zero degree arthroscope like this way. And I'm uh, using the continuous cell line infusion pump. The pressure is almost uh, 30 millimeter per mercury uh, during the surgery to control the bleeding and uh, infection. Let me show you this, uh, uh, this surgery. So if the patient to have a, a light side discarnation like this way, when you perform uh, this kind of surgery so during the, uh, at the operation table, uh, patient to move to the prone position, uh, the right side to move to the left side, like this way, on fluoroscopic guide. Uh, I prefer the two different oblique incision like this way. Proximal incision is just lateral side of spinous process and uh, lamina. And second incision is uh, lateral uh, interlaminar spaces like this way. So uh, I prefer this kind of two different uh, two oblique incision uh, like this way. Proximal is viewing and distal is walking portals. Uh, it is named as, named as uh, KU portal in our published papers 2019. Like this way, proximal is uh, uh, for the viewing with arthroscope and distal portal is 
uh, used by uh, working uh, with uh, many instruments or the other uh, procedure. And uh, I prefer the cri crystal can like this way uh, because of uh, when you perform this kind of surgery, the most important thing is uh, we, we have to know where am I. So when you're using the, this kind of uh, uh, transparent crystal cannula, you can see very easily where am I, like this way. Yeah, uh, doing the surgery, the, the, the second important thing is we have to make a very good outflow to clarify uh, imaging doing the surgery like this way. So we have to make a uh, good outflow. Uh, inflow is uh, uh, through the cannula and outflow is a skin incision at the walking portal like this way. So let me show you our surgery. Here is a patient with the uh, left side spinal stenosis. We can perform a laminectomy like this way using the uh, standard instrument. And we can also be using the uh, electrical burr to remove laminar and other facet joint. And we can remove the disc like this way very easily. After that, we can see very wide decompressed nerve root and dura uh, like this way. It's not so difficult to almost this kind of surgery we can perform uh, less than six, 60 minutes, uh, less than one hour, we can perform uh, this kind of surgery. For example, we have a uh, 78 years old female patient Patient to have a left uh, back pain with a left uh, leg radiculopathy. Uh, she could not work uh, less than five minutes. Uh, but, uh, and she also had, a, as you know, that she is a 78 years old female. Uh, so she had a very many uh, medical comorbidity like a congestive heart failure, uh, unstable angina, like this way. So uh, anesthetic grade is three. So it's very difficult to perform a huge surgery like a fusion and a decompression surgery. Uh, so she had, uh, when you look at the MRI scan of the, uh, this pain patient, uh, you can see that it's a high hypertrophy the ligament flavum on the left side. So I decided to remove uh, this only ligament flavum of the uh, left side is my target. So uh, when you perform this kind of surgery so during the uh, operation room, as I mentioned, I made uh, two different uh, oblique inc incisions for the proximal is the viewing portal and the this side is the walking portal like this way. Uh, I, I uh, have mentioned about this kind of uh, portals as a uh, KU portal, oblique portals. And holding the arthroscope to left hand and walking to right hand because of this patient target. This our target is the left side of a patient. So, uh, grasp grasp the arthroscope to left with the left hand and walking and uh, with the right hand. If the patient have a light uh, pathology, so we have to perform uh, this kind of surgery with uh, with. Uh, grasping the right hand arthroscope and working to with the left hand as well. Let me show you a video scope. So patient left side into laminar spaces. Clear it to your soft tissue using the astro care and remove the whole ligament flavum. Our target is the removal of ligament flavum like this way. You can see the wide decompressed bony structure. And here is the interlaminar spaces. You can see the hypertrophy the ligament blob here. So my target is here. So I try to remove the whole ligament blob between uh, uh, interlaminar spaces. You can see that this uh, hypertrophy the ligament blob at the uh, proximal interlaminar spaces is very difficult to remove whole ligament flavum. So I uh, perform, a, I try to remove whole ligament flavum using the, this kind of uh, angled QRS. So after removing the whole 
yeah, here it, it is our target. So after the whole re removal of ligand flab, you can see the wide decompressed dura and the love root. We can move to very easily this root very safely. After surgery, you can see the only two different skin incision, just one step. After three months, she, we perform an x-ray scan. You can see the bone removal area here between the left side interlaminar spaces. Uh, and she can work very easily and she do not have any laminate uh, claudication after surgery like this way. And the second question is about uh, if the patient have a bilateral symptoms, how can you treat? So we can do uh, each lateral and the contralateral side with uh, just one incision. Let me show you. Uh, to if the patient have a bilateral kenastenosis, we have to remove the, we have to remove uh, ipsilateral side and the contralateral side, side as well. So I introduced this oscilloscope to left side and after that remove the whole anatomical area to each lateral side. After that we angle the scope to contralateral side and we can uh, perform a contralateral decompression as well through the uh, same incision like this way. Let me show you. Yeah, here is the ipsilateral decompression. So you can you can see the free dura and the rub root at left side. So after that, we have to re uh, remove the contralateral side uh, using the uh, angle, uh, given angle as the oscilloscope tool. Here is the right side uh, interlaminar spaces and the lateral recess area. We have to remove the whole ligament flow and then you after that, we can see this uh, wide decomposition of the root to contralateral side. So here is uh, ipsilateral decompression and here is contralateral decompression. So we can do, uh, if the patient have a bilateral symptoms, we can perform a ipsilateral and contralateral side decompression using the just one skin incision uh, when you perform a left side or the right, right side as well. And we have performed this uh, clinical studies. Uh, patients have a uh, lumbar spinal stenosis. So we can perf we perform a prospective randomized comparative studies. Uh, so we compare with uh, endoscopic surgery and the bicuspid surgery. In patient, we have a uh, lumbar spinal surgery. Uh, we randomize the two groups, and after that. Uh, six months follow, we can see there is no different clinical outcomes, but uh, in patient with uh, endoscopic, endo uh, the, pa the patient group uh, with uh, using the endoscope have uh, less operation time and uh, less hemoback drain and uh, had uh, less op opioid consumption after surgery. So uh, when you look at the hospital stay, when you compare with the microscopic group, Endoscopic uh, group has have had a very shorter hospital stay period. So uh, in this study, so we can see the uh, when you compare with the microscopic groups, the endoscopic group is also the same clinical outcomes with a very uh, uh, very good clinical outcomes without any complication. So we our uh, study teams have published. The uh, four and five clinical clinical studies about uh, bio, we using the, this bipolar endoscopy surgeries in medicine and general of neurosurgery and uh, this year. So uh, when you look at the, the uh, some third papers that uh, we can uh, publish about about bipolar endoscopy surgery is the feasibility for the high grade uh, migrated lumbar disc herniation. When you look at the, this uh, high grade migrated disc, it's very difficult to, to treat. So uh, using the, this endoscope. So let me show you this video clip. It's very uh, easy to remove the whole ligament with the flab using the, this conventional 
uh, carry some punch and you can remove her very easily. Uh, upper side, my high grade and migrate disc patient. So it's very deep. Uh, when you compare with uh, this conventional surgery or the other uh, unipotal surgeries, I think it's very easy to treat and it's very uh, uh, somewhat uh, new minimal invasive surgery, but it's not so difficult to uh, perform this kind of surgery. Okay, I, I, I would like to summarize the today's talk. Uh, this bipotal endoscope or the arthroscopic spine surgery is a relatively new minimal invasive technique. Uh, as, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it has uh, many uh, technical benefits. Uh, we can do soft tissue and uh, bony, we can remove the soft tissue and the bony structures as well very easily. Compared with the conventional endoscopic surgery, it, it seems to be more easier for the lumbar laminectomy and discectomy. Uh, when you compare with the PLD, uh, I already mentioned the PLD it looks very uh, somewhat difficult to, to treat uh, a patient with a lumbar spinal stenosis. But uh, in when you when you using the this bipotal endoscopic surgery, so you can you can very easily remove our soft tissue and the, uh, bony tissue, and we can uh, as I show you our clinical trial. Uh, is uh, when you compare with the microscope, it's not so uh, different between a, uh, two groups at six months follow. As I mentioned, the bipolar spine endoscopic surgery shows a favorable clinical outcome to the patient with the lumbar spinosis compared with the MED or the uh, PLD. Uh, as you know, the PLD means uh, unipotal endoscopic surgery. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't. Uh, if you are uh, interested with uh, this kind of uh, bipolar endoscopic surgery, is uh, not to hesitate to uh, contact with me or the, our hospital staff. Uh, we can show you uh, or the, we can educate uh, uh, every information about our uh, surgery. Thank you today. Thank you, Professor Bart, for this interesting presentation. Just a uh, housekeeping note for colleagues who joined later this webinar. We will keep all the questions and, uh, to till the end of this, uh, the four presentations. And then we will join, we will invite all the panel to join the question and answer session. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Jun Ho Wang, Professor of uh, Orthopedic Surgery. He practices at Samsung Medical Center and he will uh, give a talk about the arthroscopic knee surgery. Uh, please, Professor Wang, take over. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jun Ho Wang. I'm also a pediatric surgeon and professor of Samsung Medical Center. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my experience in Samsung Medical Center. Today, I'm going to talk about ACL reconstruction technique and AAL reconstruction. Thank you all medical professionals to attend this online symposium. Here's a quick introduction about Samsung Medical Center. It is located in urban area, tertiary care hospital. We have around 2,000 inpatient beds. And every day, we have more than 9,000 outpatients, more than 8,000 medical professionals and supporting staff working for this institute. This is today's content. First, I'm going to talk about history of ACL surgical technique. In 1970s, extraarticular tenodesis is the main surgery for ACL injury. McIntosh procedure is performed in North America and Lumea procedure is performed in Europe. Both procedures were similar. ITV band was stripped and reattached on the femoral side. From 1976, open intraarticular procedure was performed. Patella tendon or hamstring tendon is used. Graft is fixed on anatomic insertion site at that time. 
in late 1980s, arthroscopic one incision transtibial technique is used. Femoral tunnel is made through tibial tunnel. This is concept of isometric reconstruction. But unfortunately, tunnel was made on non-anatomic position. From 2000, surgeons started to accept anatomic reconstruction concept. Femoral tunnel is made on anatomic insertion site. There are various reconstruction techniques for anatomical femoral tunnel formation. But trans tibia technique is considered anatomic, non considered isometry reconstruction. But graft doesn't seem to be the same as normal ACL. Transportal and outside technique is used for the anatomic reconstruction. Someone trying to do anatomic reconstruction using trans tibial technique. Second, I'm going to talk about trans tibial technique. Trans tibial technique is the most familiar technique to all surgeons. We can get relatively long femoral tunnel, but graft is placed in vertical direction. It might be rotationally unstable. Some doctors modified trans tibial technique for anatomic ACL reconstruction, but I don't think it is easy technique. Now I'm going to talk about transportal technique for anatomy ACL reconstruction. Femoral insertion site anatomy is important for anatomic ACL reconstruction. In chronic case, remnant ACL tissue is not visible. In that case, bony landmark is useful to find ACL insertion site. Lateral intercondylar reach is used for useful bony landmark, iris anterior border of ACL. Bifurcate reach is borderline between AM bundle and PL bundle. Patient setup is important for transpolar technique. Knee joint need to be bended 120 or 135 degree to avoid complication. 90 degree of knee flexion is important reference to find the femoral insertion site. Femoral insertion site looked different according to the knee flexion angle. So I prefer the draw line before draping. I will show you videos these techniques. This is a single bundle technique. Remnant tissue is not visible. Accessory aim portal is being made. I 11 blade is used. It's inserted transversely to avoid damage on the, on the meniscus. You can see femoral insertion site, some remnant tissue. Careful dissection is important to expose a bony landmark. Thermal device like astrocale is used. Exposure of a posterior cartilage line is important. So careful dissection is also important. This is the posterior border, this is distal border, this is anterior border, so called lateral intercondylar ridge. From the posterior cartilage margin, we can measure the footprint size, it's about 20 millimeter. From the cartilage margin, about 8 millimeter, we mark tunnel position. From anterior border, 12 millimeter. Using microfracture, tunnel position is marked. Measure the distance again, about 5, 8 millimeter from the posterior cartilage margin. And guide pin is inserted. In that time, 90 degree of knee flexion. After engagement of guide pin, knee joint needs to be bended 135 degree to avoid complication posterior cartilage damage. Guide pin is inserted. After then, rimmer is used to make a t femoral tunnel. In that case, we rimmed about 30 millimeter. 4.5 limo is used to use the suspensory divide fixation. After then, tunnel length is measured. In the case, tunnel length is 35, 
32. You can see the tunnel is made inside the border of footprint side. Lateral eminence is posterior border of Asia, medial spine, anterior border is Asia rich, lateral meniscus, lat lateral spine. From the Asia rich, which is anterior border, 8 millimeter is determined to make femoral tunnel. This is lateral border and medial border. We can make a tibial tunnel 5 mm from the medial spine. You can see the border line of tibial insertion site. From Asia Ridge anterior border, 8 mm, we make tibial tunnel. Microfracture all is used to mark. After then, jig is inserted. Recently, I use 55 degree, and guide pin is inserted. You can see guide pin is coming out. And tibial limo is used to make a tibial tunnel. And this pin is passed to, to the femoral tunnel, and end of suture is pulled out to the tibial tunnel for the passing of the graft. Button is passed first from tibial tunnel to femoral tunnel. You can see button and roof, and you can also see graft is following the button. There is two lines. When second line touches the cortex, button is flipped, and the graft is pulled out to tibial side to check button is firmly fixed on the femoral side. This is a reconstructed single bundle ACL. After one year's rail, you can see graft is covered by synovium, and you can also see vessels. But there are problems of transport technique, poor visualization during rimming, crowding of instrument, short femoral tunnel, and posterior wall breakage, and chondral damage on the medial femoral condyle. Acute graft tunnel bending angle is also a problem. Knee joint need to be bended 135 degree to avoid complications such as posterior cortical damage. By bending the knee, vision is getting very full. If you use flexible guide pin system, 120 degree of knee flexion is enough for the safe surgery. This flexible guide pin has 42 degree angles by itself. Flexible guide and remote system could be the solution for poor visualization. There's a chance of a crowding of instrument. Aim portal is used for building portal and accessory aim portal is used for working portal. Two portal is made too closely, chance of a crowding of instrument. Getting more space between two portal is important. During the Rimi, we did not find problem, but after Rimi, you can see no cancerous bone in the posterior, posterior side. Clinically, there was no problem, but after operation, CT scan was performed. There is posterior cortical damage. There is a chance of a chondral damage of medial femoral condyle by using conventional limo. We can reduce damage of cartilage by using eccentric limo. This is the same 10 mm limo. This limo can be passed easily on the front of medial femoral condyle. We can reduce chondral damage and only 6% of small chondral damage was report, we reported by using eccentric remo. Graft bending angle of a transporter technique is more acute than trans tibial technique. This acute graft tunnel bending angle can be cause of graft failure. Next, I'm going to talk about outside technique. Because of limited time, I will show you just video. 
accessory importer is being made, so it is also important. Pass through the media kundal and reach it to the, the femoral insertion site. Transverse incision is made. After then, we femoral insertion site is dissected. Instrument is moved vertically to avoid abutment. And careful dissection on femoral insertion site is performed using thermal device such as astrocare. An AM bundle insertion site is dissected. Careful dissection of posterior side important to see the posterior cartilage margin. And the PL bundle insertion site is dissected using thermal device. This is lateral intercondylar ridge anterior border. This is distal border. This is a proximal border, anterior, posterior border. PL bond insertion site, AM bond insertion site. This is bifurcate ridge borderline. PL and AM bond insertion site. From the posterior cartilage region, about 4 mm, there is a PCL posterior condylar ridge. Extended line from posterior lateral corner is important. Uh, about 3 mm from the posterior lateral corner extended line, 6 mm from the posterior cartilage margin, we marked AM bundle tunnel position. About 7 mm, we marked AM bundle tunnel position using microfracture hole. We, we checked the distance about 6 or 7 mm from the posterior cartilage margin. And the joint is 90 degree flexed, and we marked PL tunnel position. From contact point, draw the line, 5 mm posterior cartilage, we marked PL tunnel position. Microfracture all is used to mark position. You can see two tunnel position is marked inside the border of the HA insertion site. For the passing of the jig, mid patellar portal is made. Jig is inserted through mid patellar portal. And this guide is used for outside in. 3.2, styman pin is inserted first. You can see the styman pin is coming out to exact position. And sleeve is fixed on the cortex. After removing this styman pin, retro reaming device, flick cutter is inserted. You can see flip cutter is coming out. Diameter is 3.5, but it is flipped. In this case, a millimeter reaming is planned. It is flipped. And fix it again. And retro reaming is being performed. This is a millimeter reamer. Rubber ring is used to measure the distance of limbing. This is inside the view. From the inside out, retro limbing is performed using outside in technique. Usually 25 or 30 millimeter limbing is performed. Inserted again, and the limbing is straightened and is pulled out and tunnel length is measured using this one. AM tunnel was made. Suture is passed from femoral tunnel to temporarily it is pulled out to accessory AM portal. PL tunnel is made in same way. This is uh, intended position, but a pin is coming out the other center. We want this point, but pin coming out this one. In that case, insert another pin without removing of the first one. You can see second pin is coming out to the exact position. The, this phenomenon is very common when we use outside in technique. After then, retro reaming system is inserted. It is flipped. Inside out, retro limbing is performed by 
You think outside in technique. Tunnel length is measured again. Suture is passed to the femoral tunnel. It is temporarily pulled out, accessory and bottom. You can see two tunnel is made inside the border of anatomic insertion site. This is lateral eminence, lateral spine. The front of lateral eminence is posterior border of Asia. The lateral spine, lateral meniscus, and ACL ridge. ACL ridge is anterior border of ACL. Medial spine, top of the medial spine is medial border. In, on the tibia side, the ACL broadly attached. And center of the PL tunnel is marked. Center of AM tunnel is marked too. Footprint is measured, in that case, about 20 mm. From the ACL reach anterior border, 6 or 7 mm, we made AM tunnel. From the posterior border, 4 mm, we marked the PL tunnel. PL tunnel we marked using microfracture wall. Center of AM tunnel is marked. And 45 jig is inserted for the PL guide pin. You can see guide pin is coming out. And 55 jig is in used for the insertion of AM tunnel guide pin. You can two pin is coming out. And the PL tunnel is made using Remo and AM tunnel is made using tibia limo. Two tunnel is made inside the border of Asia. Suture is pulled out tibial tunnel for the passing of the graft. Gracilis and semite is used for the PL AM graft. PL graft is passed first. You can see button is come inside the femoral tunnel. After then, you can see graft is follow, following. Careful pulling is important to avoid over penetration. When the second line touches the cortex, graft is flipped. Graft is being flipped now. It's flipped. By pulling tibial side, we can check graft is fixed on the femoral side properly. Second, AN graft is being passed to, from tibial tunnel to femoral tunnel. You can see the sutures and graft is passed to the femoral side by pulling the, the reading suture. You can see the sutures, buttons, and the following graft. Careful pulling is important. Sometimes button coming outside of the skin. In that case, we need uh, some dissection. By pulling the, the other side, button is flipped. By pulling tibia side, we checked. When second line touches the cortex, Graft is flipped, pulled, pulled the tibia side, and graft is fixed in fully extended position. You can see double bond reconstruction. There are many advantages of this advantage of each technique. Trans tibia technique is familiar to almost surgeons. But this advantage is graft is placed in vertically. Transportal and outside technique is used for the anatomy reconstruction. The problem of transportal technique is poor visualization during limbing. Problem of outside technique 
is an unwanted location of guide pin. If remnant preservation is possible, I prefer to do remnant preservation technique using outside technique. If impossible, I use transporter technique, sometimes double bundle, sometimes single bundle. Lastly, I'm going to talk about anterolateral ligament reconstruction. There are many complicated structures on the lateral side of the knee. You can also see ligament-like structure which is beside the lateral collateral ligament. We call it ALL, anterolateral ligament. Origin of ALL is proximal and posterior side of the epicondyle. TBR insertion site is located in midway between Gordy's tubercle and fibula head. Sonori Cotet is the most famous guy regarding ALL reconstruction. He used autograft and he drilled a femoral tunnel outside in technique at the ALL anatomic insertion site. Passed the graft to the anatomic insertion site and also passed the graft posterior tibial tunnel to anterior tunnel and going back to femoral side and tied on the femoral side. Indication of ALL reconstruction is suggested by many authors. But most important thing is high grade pivot shift. And revision case, if a patient is involving pivoting spots, hyperexerty patient, maybe the patient needs ALL reconstruction. By just adding the ALL, Revision rate is lowered about 2.6%. So in ALL reconstruction might be useful to increase success rate. This is my technique. I modify technique from the sonori cotet. Femoral tunnel is made between lateral epicondyle and posterior edge of lateral femoral condyle. And tibial insertion site, anterior site is made around the goddess tubercle. Posterior tunnel is made just front of fibula head. I perform to use a single or double bundle. Usually use glassless tendon. It's fixed with interference screw. I will show you videos. Two incision is made on the tibial side. One is made just behind the goddess tubercle. The other is made on the front of fibula head. And number five edge bond needle is bended for the passing of the graft. And the six millimeter is reamer is used for the tibial posterior tunnel and the anterior tunnel. After removing of guide pin, right angle is used to widen the tunnel and connect posterior tunnel and anterior tunnel. It is inserted posteriorly, advanced anteriorly. It's inserted anterior tunnel and advanced to the posterior side. After that, needle is passed from backside. By passing from the backside, loop is inserted from anterior to the posterior side. Loop is pulled out on the posterior side. After then it is cut. We have to make a short suture inside the bony tunnel. And three centimeter incision is made on the femoral side. ITB was split also and between posterior corner of the lateral epi epicondyle and guide pin is inserted. Excursion is need to check and flexed position and extended position length should be longer. And posterior excursion is measured 
and extend this position. Usually 5 to 10 mm excursion on the posterior rim. Anterior rim excursion is also measured. In extended position, excursion of anterior rim is around 5 mm. After then, 5 mm rimmer is used to make a femoral tunnel. And graft is fixed. And interpular screw is used. In this case, we use a sweep block. It is tapped and bio interpular screw is advanced. We have to make sure craft is firmly fixed. And the end of graft is passed to the tibia side. First, it is passed to the posterior side. And the end of suture is engaged inside the loop. By pulling the loop, graft is passed through the tibial bony tunnel. And the end of the graft is coming back to femoral side. And extended position it is tied. In summary, transtibial technique can be used to anatomical ACL reconstruction, but I don't think it is easy. Usually, transportal and outside techniques use anatomic reconstruction. Boston technique can be used, but it depends on surgeon's preference. By using transportal technique, we can get consistent tunnel position. By using outside technique, surgery can be more convenient and more safer. AERL reconstruction might be a solution for residual instability after ACL reconstruction. Thank you for your attention. Academic communication is important for the advancement of medical science. I hope after overcoming of COVID-19, we can communicate face on face. Thank you again. Thank you, Professor Wang, for excellent presentation. Now I'm honored to present Professor Don Wong Kra from Severance Hospital and the exciting presentation regarding robotic assisted gait training and wearable exoskeletal robotic orthosis. Uh, please, Professor Wong. Uh, thank you very much for giving me a chance to present at this excellent online meeting. Uh, my name is Dong Ra. Uh, I'm working at Severance Rehabilitation Hospital, affiliated Yonsei University College of Medicine. Uh, clinically, I specialized in pediatric rehabilitation, uh, which means uh, care for children with disabilities. My research interest is biomechanics of human and assistive technologies to help the disabled persons uh, to recover their lost function. That's why I'm also working at uh, as a chief clinical technology officer at Angel Robotics Company, uh, which is a company that uh, specialized in development of wearable exoskeletal robot. Uh, today, I'll talk about uh, robot-assisted gait training in rehabilitation. Uh, robotic rehabilitation is a leading edge technology in rehabilitation medicine. Take a look at this PubMed search using two keywords, robot and rehabilitation. You can see the number of studies started to increase in about 2004 and recently is skyrocketing up to over 100 papers per year. 
Robotic rehabilitation has two principles of use, model practice and model assistance. Using this robot-assisted fatigue-free training, we can provide optimal, task-specific, goal-oriented, and intense motor training, which would ultimately lead to more independent lives in our patients. As I mentioned before, robotic rehabilitation has two principles, model practice and model assistance. For model practice, robots should adopt the challenge-based strategies. In other words, the robot would provide challenging tasks to patients for training purposes. But for model assistance, robots should compensate for the impaired function of disabled persons. In the left-sided video, we are expecting the patient to walk better after robot-assisted gait training. However, in the right-sided video, the patient uses the wearable robot to compensate her gait impairment during daily life. Therefore, for modal practice, we are using a robot as a medical device to promote functional recovery. But for modal assistance, we are using a robot as a type of orthosis or assistive device to compensate for the impaired function. First, I will talk about the therapeutic use of a robot. It is known that intensive and repetitive gait training is more effective for recovery of gait function. The left-sided video shows partial weight-bearing treadmill training. Body weight is partially supported by harness, and one therapist holds the patient's waist and shifting the weight left and right. And Two more therapists are holding each leg and making it motion using their hands ceaselessly. This kind of gait training showed better therapeutic results in previous studies, but it is definitely impractical for common rehabilitation practices because it requires substantial amount of labor by therapists. RAGT, Robot Assisted Gait Training, can provide this kind of intensive, repetitive gait training using robotic technologies. For optimal model practice, the difficulty of training task should be challenging but not disappointing. Therefore, Actuating mechanism and training environments of RAGT should be specifically programmed to accommodate each patient's varying degree of impairments. So one robot for all patients is impossible. For gait training, there are three major robotic categories. Tethered exoskeletal systems, such as Locomat in the left-sided video, apply forces through a rigid articulated frame moving the patient's legs with a body weight support system. And effect system, such as morning walk in the middle area of slide video, is working based on a constraint at the distal end of the legs that specify the trajectory there and proximal joint can simply move following the body geometry. Wearable overground exoskeletal system such as Angelex in the right side video, the product from my company Angelovatics is powered articulated suit with self-contained power sources and contra-algorithms that 
allows the most freedom and uh, realistic walking experience. When a patient gets injured and has a disturbance as a result, uh, we are trying to optimize neuroplasticity and recover the motor function as much as possible in acute phase. During this acute phase, RAGT can provide intensive and repetitive gait training for motor recovery. Even though we know that we can achieve optimal motor recovery during acute phase, the functional regression is faster than non-disabled persons as time goes by. Therefore, personal or home-based continuous training is important to maintain physical fitness, which means non-motor recovery. Therefore, hospital-based RAGT is needed for acute phase motor recovery in acute care units, and personal robot is also important for chronic phase non-motor recovery in disabled persons at home or long-term care units. That's why my Angel Robot company has a product and service continuum from acute hospital care with Angelix Medical to long-term home care with Angelix Home. Uh, this is a robotic rehabilitation center in Severance Rehabilitation Hospital. We have portfolio of rehabilitation robots for the patients with various functional impairments from severely impaired persons to disabled but ambulatory persons. Uh, these gate training robots are digital devices, so they also can assess the gate function of the patients more quantitatively. With this digital data from robots, we will be able to monitor the patients quantitatively, analyze the big data, big data from them, and provide more precise rehabilitation for optimal recovery in the future. Let me show the cases who experienced the effects of RAGT. The first case is a boy with hemiplasia caused by cerebral infarction. Uh, he got RAGT just two months after onset of acute rehabilitation to promote neuroplasticity. In the left-sided video, uh, you can see stiff knee gait pattern on left affected side, meaning decreased knee flexion during swing phase of gait. This is a typical abnormal gait pattern shown in spastic hemiplasia. In right-sided video, stiff knee gait pattern disappeared with knee flexion torque assist by robot. Uh, after 20 sessions of RAGT, his stiff knee gait pattern showed improvements. You can see more knee flexion during swing phase and gait pattern is more natural than before RAGT. We don't have the result of group comparison study yet, but we are working on it now. The second case is 13-year-old boy. He is a boy with spastic cerebral palsy, GMFCS3 level, which means that he can only walk with handheld mobility device in most indoor setting. He undertook the orthopedic surgery to correct the crouch deformities in 2014. After that, 
he has received the post rehabilitation training to improve gait function. Even after surgery and post rehabilitation, he could walk slowly using bilateral crutches, showing poor balance control ability. Uh, these are videos from 14 sessions of REGT with the robot. He could walk fast and more stable without the robot. He already could walk better than before REGT. This is the comparison of gait function uh, between pre REGT assessment and assessment after 17 sessions of REGT. He could walk much faster and more easily after REGT. On clinical evaluations, uh, his gross motor function was improved in six minute walk test, reflecting gait endurance and aerobic capacity showed he could walk more than 500% of distance after REGT. The energy consumption during gait measured by oxygen cost was decreased less than one third after REGT. This means a 13 year old boy with spastic CP could walk much faster with less energy consumption after overground REGT using wearable exoskeletal robot. We think it's an example of non-motor recovery in chronic phase. Furthermore, we tested the feasibility of home-based REGT using this wearable exoskeletal robot. As you can see, uh, our initial testing showed that it is safe and feasible for most subjects. Now we are planning to develop the Angelex home version. Next, I will talk about the assistive use of a robot. Assistive strategy is different for complete paralysis and incomplete paralysis. Complete paralysis has no voluntary movement. So it needs higher torque to move the legs and robust, robust st structure to support the legs and body weight. Because voluntary movements remain in incomplete paralysis, a robot should not interfere with the patient's voluntary movement and it should be light and easy for done and off. There are some robots for complete paraplegia in the market. Each product has its strengths and weaknesses. However, all products have robust structure and counter algorithm to move the joint just according to the pre-planned trajectories. Maybe some of the listeners have heard about Cybethylon competition held in November this year. Cybethylon is a unique competition in which people with physical disabilities compete each other to complete everyday tasks using the state-of-the-art technical assistance systems. Team Angelovatics developed the walk-on suit for complete paraplegic persons to walk with. Our team won a gold and bronze medals in exoskeleton race this year. Even he finished the race faster than most powered wheelchair participants. For the incomplete paraplegia, Different control algorithm is needed for wearable exoskeletal robot. A robot should be able to detect the 
patient's intention to move and assist joint torque as needed. We are developing angel suit for incomplete paraplegic patients. I will show you one case using exoskeletal robotic suit to walk in daily life. Uh, this case is 11-year-old girl with incomplete paraplegia caused by spinal bifida. She can walk short distance in very slow speed, just in the level, only with solid effort to support her ankles. We developed a wearable exoskeletal lobo suit, we call it angel suit, which can detect gay face from foot plantar pressure sensors and assist hip and knee joint movement by providing assistive torque using transparent actuators. Last year, our team traveled with her to the States to attend the WearaCon, which is the conference of wearable robots. Uh, she could walk around the shopping mall with her mom and she truly enjoyed the attractions by walking with her robot. Uh, there are some take-home messages. Usually, uh, older emerging technologies show ups and downs to launch onto the market successfully. Uh, previously, there was an inflated expectation for the robotic rehabilitation. But I think we made significant progress over the years. I strongly believe that we made through the trough of, di trough of disillusionment and now is becoming common practice in rehabilitation area. But it is still hard to satisfy both functionality and adaptability for innovative technologies including rehabilitation robotics. Many engineers and clinicians like me are working hard to proceed to the feasible and affordable level. As I have stated before, I believe we have made significant progress, but we still have long ways to go. There is plenty of undone, undone work to do for real professionals. Real professionals need to optimize the effects of robotic rehabilitation, decide compatibility for robotic rehabilitation, choose proper robot for patients with various kinds of disabilities, optimize assisting algorithms, train patients for embodiment of RAGT, assess the effects of RAGT. I think this will be the new roles of rehabilitation professionals in the future. I talked about the state of the art uh, technologies in rehabilitation medicine, the robotic rehabilitation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Ra, for this great presentation. It's time now for question and answers. We will start with a question to Professor uh, Wang. Uh, what's your opinion about the, uh, degenerated crochet ligament in elderly? Yes, so uh, can I speak now? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, okay. So, so uh, the ACL de de degeneration is one of the signs of knee joint de de degeneration. So, it is not good can candidate for ACL reconstruction. Healthy ACL was torn 
uh, traumatically, uh, there is the good candidate for Asia reconstruction. So Asia regiment, Asia degeneration should be treated as so the degenerate degeneration can the, the disease. So it is not good candidate for reconstruction. Okay. Thank you. So another question to Professor John regarding the C acne. Um, it's a, it says it's associated with complications and low grade infection. Uh, the question is, do you see a problem with it in your practice? Hi, uh, thank you very much for your question. I think that is a very tricky but valid question. I mean, C acne is really troublesome, particularly for shoulder osteoplasty. And it has been reported very common complication, but as you be very careful, especially when you deal with this axillary or skin prep, I think you can avoid it on top of this uh, uh, prophylactic antibiotics and post-op uh, antibiotics. But there's no clear guideline how we can avoid this uh, acne infection because this is not truly a very strong uh, 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 viral uh, uh, virulent, uh, uh, you know, my, uh, bacteria. But it's an, like a normal skin uh, flora, but sometimes it makes infection. So uh, one thing you can be very careful is uh, during your implantation, be careful not to touch the skin with the implant. I think that's uh, some uh, technical tips I can give you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another question for you, uh, Professor John. Yeah. How about the acromial, acromial fracture in reverse total arthroplasty? Do you think there are risk factors while performing the procedure? Oh, yeah, that is very true, especially in my area. In my country, we have an Asian lady, very small shoulder with a, a small acromion. Then if you have a long-standing chronic rotator cuff tear, your acromion is already very, very uh, slim and thin, then there is a very high risk, particularly if you have overtension of the deltoid. So you should be very careful not to make overtensioning. But when you have a delayed stress fracture in the acromion, it is okay to leave rather than fix it because the surgical outcome is not really brilliant. So my recommendation to you, if you have any acromion stress fracture, do it conservatively. The outcome is not really bad. So we have a very uh, recent report published and had a journal review last week. The outcome is not really bad. So you can leave it. Thank you. Thank you. And a uh, third question for you, if you don't mind, Prof. John. It is no about uh, yeah, preoperative measurement of the thickness of the center of the humeral head does predict the screw cut out after looking braid of proximal humeral fracture. So this is about the proximal humeral fracture and asking if the preoperative measurement of the thickness of the center of the humeral head, is there a relation between the screw cut out and this thickness of the humeral head? Well, you know, uh, if you are planning uh, planning the reverse total shoulder for proximal humerus fracture. This is a something different from the hemiastroplasty because this is not anatomic reconstruction. So keep in mind, by doing reverse total shoulder replacement, you are actually making a new shoulder biomechanics within the shoulder joint. Three important things. You need to position the glenoid inferior translation inferior tilting, and then have a proper tension of the deltoid. If you keep in mind these three factors, usually the outcome is good, but this reverse is a different from hemi because if you place this one very low, you have over tension and you have a big dead space and it can be chance of infection in there. So pre-op measurement of the humeral head, no, not really, not really, a uh, the, the helpful in my practice. So whenever I do 
I'm, I'm always using the center of glenoid a little more down. And I measure, I evaluate the internal external rotation to see whether there's any, uh, you know, open book phenomenon. And then I check this uh, biceps uh, conjoined tendon uh, tension and the deltoid tension. And that's how you should do. There's a lot of debate whether you need to fix the tuberosity back to the humerus or not. But in my practice, the result is not really super different. Thank you. Thank but you. I'm, I'm happy to uh, write uh, your questions a real time. Okay. So uh, please leave your questions. Good. Great. Thank you. A question to Professor Park regarding the spinal surgery uh, is regarding the difference in the outcome between endoscopic versus open laminectomy for spinal stenosis. Do you see difference at all, Professor Park? Yeah, uh, thank you for the your <coughs> nice questions. Uh, as I mentioned in my papers, uh, when you compare with uh, uh, open surgery, the, uh, usually we can we can use the microscope or the other open eye. Uh, when you compare with uh, uh, conventional microscopic surgery, uh, endoscopic surgery can be used in patients uh, with a lumbar spinal stenosis. In my uh, randomized control trials uh, about two years ago, uh, I cannot find any uh, difference between the two groups in six months uh, follow. So when you when you uh, when you when you have uh, some patient who have a very uh, old age and uh, high uh, morbidity cases, uh, we can treat this uh, minimal this minimal invasive bipolar endoscopic surgery in that patient. We can. Uh, control the without any risk, and uh, we uh, we can very, uh, we can give some uh, very good clinical outcomes uh, without any uh, severe uh, morbidity or the high risk. So uh, I believe I I think this kind of uh, endoscopic spinal surgery is a very fancy, and uh, uh, this kind of techniques is increasing. Uh, this demand of this kind of Technique is very increasing in patients and the doctors as well. Thank you for your uh, question. Thank you. Another question for you, Dr. Bark. It, uh, your revision rate for in this COVID laminectomy. Uh, uh, I beg your pardon, is uh, your question about revision cases? Yes, it's regarding the revision uh, yeah. rate. Yeah, in terms of revisions, we, we have to uh, we have to uh, we have to perform the kind of uh, studies uh, because as you know that this endoscopic surgery is very uh, difficult to learn and we, uh, it's very difficult to apply to in revision cases. Uh, but nowadays we uh, I have started this kind of surgery over six years. We I perform the kind of surgery more than seven hundred cases in my hospital. So nowadays, I do not hesitate to apply uh, that surgery to patients to have a, a, with a revision cases. Uh, but as you know, that this kind of surgery can, uh, cannot be all in all every case in spine surgery. But uh, I think the, uh, the uh, indication and uh, uh, application of this kind of surgery in spine field is increasing. Now, uh, I think it will be increased uh, in my uh, performance or the uh, our hospitals in our hospitals. So uh, uh, in conclusion, I, I think the uh, revision cases cannot be contraindicated in, uh, uh, with this kind of uh, endoscopic surgery. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, few more questions for you, if you don't mind. So uh, how about the learning curve for minimally invasive spinal surgery? In your practice, how long will it take to train uh, one of your uh, yeah. I uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I think your your question is about a learning curve in uh, to have a, a, a nice care in spine surgery in, uh, when you when you have a when you perform with a bipolar endoscopy surgery. In my uh, uh, as I mentioned, I perform more than seven hundred cases in my hospitals. Uh, in my cases, uh, I think the 25 cases may be enough for to uh, uh, for the, uh, applying for the uh, this kind of surgery in patient. 
uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we are all the all space surgeons, so we are very familiar with the endoscope uh, or the arthroscope, arthroscopic surgery. So I think the bipotal endoscopic surgery is almost the same as uh, uh, arthroscopic surgery in the shoulder and, the spa, uh, and knee joint. So I think the uh, 25 cases is enough. Thank, Thank you. you. How about complications with this uh, technique? Uh, do you have a rough idea the rate of complications and how do you deal with it? Uh, I don't know. This question is for me? Yes, sorry, I, Professor Bob. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, yeah the, the, when you look at the, the complication of uh, uh, spine surgery uh, with the bipolar endoscopy surgery, so we, we also the, uh, experience many um, somewhat uh, small cases of complication, such as the dura tear during the surgery, or the uh, uh, I published about a higher uh, uh, higher pressure in cervical spine when you perform a this kind of surgery because of uh, some uh, water pressure. So, but uh, uh, when you uh, when you focus about the uh, complication, it is not so big problem during the surgeries. So I think the running curve is 25 cases is enough. So after the 25 cases, uh, I think that, uh, this, uh, this endoscopic surgery is not so big problem for uh, some, uh, because of some, uh, we do not hesitate to this kind of surgery because of uh, uh, this kind of complication. But uh, we have to uh, focus on the, it can be, uh, uh, it can be uh, uh, that kind of dura tear or the other uh, small complication can be expected during the surgery. Uh, almost the same as uh, open surgery. Thank you. Thank you. So a few questions to uh, Professor Wang. Regarding the antenna, do you think the antenna placed ligament augmentation and yeah. dynamic interligamentary stabilization protect the primary ACL and how? Yeah, I, I know the concept of internal brace, brace ratio with the augmentation. So it is effective. I, I believe some effect of internal brace. But basically, ACL was torn completely. ACL reconstruction is necessary. But some some uh, some case we we we, so we see many partial tear of ACL. So ACL is unstable. So ACL reconstruction is necessary. In case of partial tear, so internal brace is in, you know, uh, effective, but in in my case series, I performed the ACL uh, augmentation with remnant preservation technique. I remnant is uh, available. I suture the remnant and pull out through the femoral tunnel, and ACL reconstruct. Uh, I perform ACL reconstruction with you hamstring or or the other allograft. So the technique might be better than ACL the internal brace technique. But internal, we use the non-absorbable suture materials for the internal brace. So that, that it is helpful for a couple of months, but it does not, does not, in may in in near future, a couple of months later, it function, we don't, we don't think it's function it continuous. So the, I believe the internal, so a remnant preservation and ACL reconstruction technique might be better. Thank you. This uh, question is slightly off uh, topic, but what is the youngest and oldest age to do a knee replacement in your practice? Yeah, so is this my question? Yes, uh, Professor Wang, yes. Yeah, yeah, so, so in Korea, there is a, a strict regulation by government. So usually, I do we don't do perform the uh, replacement surgery for younger patient, but the special case we performed in the forties, uh, such as 45, 42 cases we perform ACL reconstruction. So uh, uh, no, 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 totally replacement surgery. But uh, the oldest people, so, so I in my case series, so. 
maybe 80s, 80s, uh, late 80s, 87, 86. So I, I don't have a rep so experience of more than 90. Thank you. And how about the age limit for AC and reconstruction? Ah, AC reconstruction limit. So, so usually I do not perform AC reconstruction over 60, but in Korea, uh, some, some patient is very active. Even patient age is 65, 67, uh, 70. So, so, so all the patient, uh, uh, the very active patient too, who enjoying the skiing or like things, things, I perform AC reconstruction usually, but don't do AC reconstruction more, six, more than 60. In case of radius, radius in Korean, radius uh, activity is very low. So usually more than 50 radius, we, I do, 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 do not perform AC reconstruction. So they just do walking, they perform the just walking exercise. Uh, I don't think that patient need uh, AC reconstruction. That's great, thank you. Uh, a question to Professor Ra. Uh, it is really interesting to see that this improvement uh, all over uh, the world with uh, exoskeleton and robotic assisted uh, rehabilitation. Uh, what I wonder is that, is there a register for this improvement because to keep with the advances and the base is really difficult. Is there like a local or national register for the uh, wearables? In your opinion, is it needed or not? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't catch. Sorry, Professor Ra. Yeah. Uh, I'm just asking about the, is, if there is a register for the uh, new technology in the exoskeleton and the robotic assisted uh, rehabilitation devices. Because what's happening is each country is trying to develop its own uh, portfolio and it becomes difficult to cope with the improvement, which one is providing what uh, kind of treatment. So is there a register, national or local register for these exoskeleton uh, devices or not? I'm sorry, lo local register. Can you hear me? Uh, well, I don't know. I uh, completely, uh, completely understand your question, but uh, well, uh, this kind of robots are uh, uh, mostly uh, leading edge technologies. And uh, now uh, is uh, start to, appear in the market. So um, there are, uh, the regulation is uh, very different at each country. So yes. yeah, so uh, in Korea, uh, well, there are some uh, rehabilitation robot, uh, well, uh, has uh, permission to use in hospital. So, uh, yeah, well, we can uh, apply uh, those robots uh, for many patients uh, in hospital. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, a question to uh, Professor Wang. Uh, bore beak dorsiflexion influence the knee dynamics in uh, valgus position. What do you think about the dorsiflexion? Uh, sorry, this is for, it's not clear if it is for regarding the knee arthroscopic treatment or this is for rehabilitation. Actually, so what, yeah. yes. Oh, uh, uh... Mm, I don't know. I, I don't understand the completely that question. Yeah. The ankle position affect the knee joint, the alignment. So maybe the hindu valgus can affect the knee joint, the dynamic valgus or alignment. So uh, I can't say exactly. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank doctor, you. Doctor, yes, thank doctor, you. Doctor, doctor, can, doctor can answer. The question, I think, so yeah. Have... Uh, 
Professor Ra, if you can add your opinion regarding the valgus uh, effect on dynamic knee movement. Sorry, the connection is not good, so I, I didn't catch what you're saying. So the question is, poor peak dorsiflexion influence in knee dynamic valgus. So uh, unfortunately, uh, the question is not phrased clearly, but I think it is asking about uh, the dorsiflexion influence on the dynamic knee movement. You mean that? Uh, Ankle dorsi flexion? Yes. Uh, ankle dorsi flexion affect the knee movement dynamically? Uh, yeah. Uh, perhaps we should move on. It's not clear question if you, Dr. Omar, if you want to rephrase your question. And we'll move on to question to Professor John. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, so it is asking about the range of motion after reverse shoulder replacement. What is the expected range of motion? Well, yes, that's a very good question because you can provide somewhat important information to your patient to persuade. So in what situation you can try a reverse total shoulder? First, for massive rotating of tear, mostly patients, they come with this, okay? pseudo paralysis then you can try reverse total shoulder and can achieve at least 120 250 degree of active elevation which is great so for normal daily living you need over 120 then it can be very very successful but in trauma cases of course patients pre of condition is really good, then you can really restore normal shoulder. But at least this 120, 250 is usually guaranteed if you do a reverse right. Thank you. Thank you. How about the rate of reverse shoulder replacement compared to anatomical anhemia? I think recent papers from Europe and America show that the significant increase in using reverse and the hemi and total are actually coming down, almost uh, coming to be a lost art nowadays. What do you think of this? Dr. Sharif, that is a very valid question. We have to keep in mind because we are all orthopedic surgeons dealing with the joint. So mm -hmm. in my mind, bottom line is anatomic total shoulder replacement is the best. Okay? If you do the anatomic total shoulder replacement, that is the best solution. However, wrong surgery, if you do the anatomic total shoulder wrong, then the result is much worse than reverse total shoulder replacement. So mm -hmm. if you have a proper rotated cuff, good envelope, good position of the implant, anatomic total shoulder is the best. But if you, some, whatever situation, if you cannot do it right, then reverse probably will be the next option. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Wang, what is your preferred option or technique to do a, re a re revision of ACL? So failed ACL, which is your preferred technique and why? Yeah, so, so it depends on the tunnel position. The, the, the previous tunnel was made on exact right position, we use that tunnel again. And we use a little bit thicker graft. And if the previous tunnel is, was made in wrong position, we make the new tunnel. So that there was no problem to make a new tunnel. In, but in case the tunnel is, the intended tunnel position is overlapping with the previous tunnel, in that case, I prefer to use bone graft and second stage operation. Some case we have a tunnel widening, widening status. In that case, also I perform the two stage operation, bone graft first. After the minimum of three months, I perform the revision replacement surgery. Uh, some patients come again the second, after second failure. In third, uh, third ACL reconstruction case, I prefer to, to do use the over the top technique. 
then I use tibial tunnel again, and I do not make a use a femoral tunnel. Pass the graph to backside of the femoral condyle, and we use over the time technique. So in case of third revision case, yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Bart. Uh, my last question for you: What do you think is the next stage with endoscopic surgery in spinal treatment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your nice question. The neural question about the future of the spine surgery. So, yes. uh, I do not sure that, but uh, maybe I think uh, the need of uh, minimal invasive surgery is uh, increasing. And maybe the robotic surgery, the need of robotic surgery is uh, also, be, also is increasing. So, uh, Today, I show you about um, uh, minimal invasive uh, decompressive surgery using the endoscope. But uh, nowadays, I, 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 I perform a, a fusion surgery. I, I, I apply the uh, endoscopic surgery to, to the fusion surgery. Uh, in my case, it's uh, about a, a one level or a two level uh, degenerative body. Uh, when you perform a fusion surgery, then you can apply in the, endoscopic compression and the cage insertion into the disc spaces. And after that, we can perform a, a pocket uh, fixation. So uh, when you compare with the previous surgery uh, about 10 years, about 20 years ago, uh, our surgeries uh, become, uh, is becoming more, uh, very smaller, with a smaller incision and with very, very minimal invasive surgery when you compare with uh, about 10 or 20 years of surgery. So uh, in conclusion, it's my opinion, our uh, pattern of uh, our spine surgery is maybe many changes uh, uh, into the minimal invasive surgery or the robotic surgeries uh, or the computerized surgery. Uh, it will be uh, nowadays very change of uh, period, I think. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And last question, similar to Professor Ra. What do you think is the next step with the rehabilitation, robotics, and exoskeleton? What do we, should we expect next? Thank you for a good question. So, uh, actually, uh, this year, uh, there was a, a 2020 Cyber Salon competition. Uh, well, uh, actually, uh, we are uh, developed the uh, exoskeletal suit for complete paraplegic patient. And uh, well, uh, happily, we got first uh, position at uh, exoskeletal race there. But uh, the more a uh, happy thing for me is that uh, our robot uh, was faster than most uh, powered wheelchair racer. So uh, it means uh, the exoskeletal robot is becoming a, a well, common also says for uh, the patients with disabilities. So I hope, uh, it will be uh, more affordable for uh, many, uh, many people with disability in the future uh, in, uh, well, in the aspect of effectiveness and uh, affordability and cost effectiveness. So uh, I believe that, yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks all and this, uh time to end this lovely and interesting session. Uh, thanks to all the faculty to keep on time and uh, the, uh, answering all the questions. We have so many questions left, we can try to answer these by emails rather than taking more time of uh, you and the faculty. Thanks all and thanks for the attendance. Uh, it was great to have you all and uh, great to have your participants. Uh, we'll meet again in the future. Please keep up. Keep the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, doctors. What is the secret behind Korea's success against COVID-19? 
The answer is Korean medical professionals and their dedication to keeping people safe. Today, the world has its eyes on K-Medical. We will continue our efforts to keep your days free from harm. Deliver state-of-the-art medical services for a safer tomorrow. And continue to build a better future. For a happier tomorrow, K-Medical.